Good morning and welcome to Rosedale Community Church with our online message today. This is our summer series where we look at various verses from the scripture to find out what the wisdom of God is for our time today. And this morning, the message is Rise and Shine. When I was a youngster, you've heard me tell many of these stories before, we used to um, take children and young people away um, each weekend, often through the summer, for a weekend of activities. A weekend of activities. It would be climbing, rock climbing, gorge walking, canoeing, you know, those kind of things, and the gospel and Jesus. And that's what my family did. And um, so all, all the summer months were filled up with that. We lived in York at the time and we would head out to the Yorkshire Dales and um, take over maybe um, a, one of the places we took over was an old um, um, train station hut. You know, we took over a scout camp. Um, we took over other places. And one of our favourite places to stay was a big old barn in the middle of a field, okay? And there was no road to it, so we had to take all of our gear with us and climb over the stiles and walk across a couple of fields to this big barn. And we used to say it was five-star accommodation because as you lay there and looked up, there were so many holes in the roof, you could see at least five stars um, through, the, through the roof. And um, I, honestly, you wouldn't be allowed to do it now, but this was, you know, we're, we're talking 35 years ago. So it was, it was yeah, it was, um, it was great. And we would all um, gather round, and there was this great big, the, the top of the barn, a great big um, kind of uh, uh, platform, and um, everybody would find their place and roll out their beds and their sleeping bags and sleep or not sleep. Um, you know, whilst we were there. And um, my dad, being who he was, and um, he, would, um, he would sleep downstairs, just in terms of security and things, not that it, there was anything problems with that, but he would sleep downstairs. But each, in the morning, he would, he would get up and we would hear him say, well, folks, it's a wonderful day today. Rise and shine. We are going to have a fantastic day. And we would all roll over with a groan and climb, you know, sink further into our sleeping bags and say, oh, not ready to get up. And he would, you know, in his big booming army voice, yes, folks, second call, rise and shine. We're going to have a wonderful day. And we would have a wonderful day. Um, so I, I remember this phrase. Anybody else ever use this phrase? Come on, time to rise and shine. Yeah. Rise and shine, folks. Maybe you even say that to your children or grandchildren. Yeah, rise and shine. And um, did you know that this comes from the scriptures? This is a Bible verse. And this is what we're going to be looking at um, today. So it's in Isaiah 60. As you are turning to Isaiah 60, I want to ask you, my, that was my dad yelling, you know, at the top of his voice, rise and shine. You know, but I want to ask you, what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning? Yeah. Alarm clock. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh Hannah's pointing at me. I go out of bed in the morning. I do on a Sunday before I leave to church. I go up to her room and give her kisses and say, darling, darling, it's time to wake up. Um, what else? What else gets you out of bed in the morning? Food. Food. <laughs> Yeah. Cup of tea or coffee, that gets you out of bed in the morning. You know, your alarm clock, maybe you get out of bed in the morning because you've got a child jumping on you and there's no possibility of any more sleep. Do you get out of bed in the morning because you've got a job to do? You've got to pay the bills. Do you get out of bed in the morning saying, yes, this is the day the Lord has made? <laughs> Okay, you're all laughing at me. Hey, you never know. You know, do you get out of bed in the morning because, you know, this is, this is what God has made you for, to get up and to worship him. We're going to have a look at Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60, and I'm reading um, verse 1 to 9. 60, 60, verse 1 to 9. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you, your sons from afar, and your daughters are carried on the hip. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you, to the riches of the nation. To you, the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ether, and all from Sheba will come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. All Kedah's flocks will be gathered to you. The rams of Neboth will serve you. They will be accepted as offerings on my altar, and I will adorn my glorious temple. Who are these that fly along the clouds like dove to their nests? Surely the islands look to me. In the lead of the ships of Tarshish, bringing your children from afar with their silver and gold to the honour of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendour. Wonderful words, eh? Wonderful words. So what is, this, what is this passage talking about? Well, this is a prophecy given by Isaiah many years before the events of this chapter. Okay, so this is a prophecy given of what is going to be. But what's very interesting about this passage is that there's actually several layers to this prophecy. Several layers to this prophecy. What do I mean? Well, is, um, Isaiah is speaking this out at a time, at a time when the prophets are warning Israel, you better shape up and start worshipping God and God only and not the idols, or else you are going to be shipped out into captivity, into Babylon. There's going to be judgment if you don't follow me, is what God is saying. And so this is at a time when they are when God's judgment is being proclaimed and Isaiah is saying, listen, if you don't follow the Lord God, you are going to be punished. There is punishment coming. And that punishment did come. It came by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, coming in, destroying Jerusalem, destroying Israel and taking a lot of the Israelites captive to Babylon and ruining um, Jerusalem. Okay, so the, the walls were broken down, the gates were burned, and the temple was in ruins. Okay, and what Isaiah says is that is going to happen, but then, but then is going to come a time when God will bring you back. And this prophecy in Isaiah 60 is a prophecy about that time. A time when, after there had been the terrible, terrible um, carnage, war, devastation, and people taken into slavery, God was going to bring people back to Jerusalem. And you may remember the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, who was about God bringing them back. Well, this is what this prophecy speaks about. This prophecy speaks about a time when the glory of the Lord will once again be upon you, Jerusalem, because I'm going to restore you and bring you back. However, this is a prophecy that's picked up in the New Testament as being about Jesus, John 1. I'll have a look at that in a moment. When, when, when the prophecy was, into the darkness came the light, Jesus, the light of the world. And interestingly, I think that this is what Jesus was thinking about when he spoke those verses in Matthew 5 that we read at the beginning of the service. You are the light of the world. You are to be like a city on a hill, shining out your light to everyone. Now, yesterday, yesterday evening, I was with friends at a barbecue, and because we are so British, we sat there, of course, talking about the weather. 
because that's what we all do, don't we? Yes, we all talk about the weather. And I was saying that I thought the last few weeks of August, not July, July it rained every day pretty much, but I was saying I thought the last few weeks of August have been pretty good. There have been the odd days of rain and lots of sunshine. And they were all sitting around saying, Bethany, have you been in the same England that we are? And they were saying, no, 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 it hasn't. It's been terrible. And I was thinking, well, I got sunburnt on my walk and we only got rained on once. And I, was, I think it's been pretty good. They thought it was different we can debate the weather afterwards that's fine because we do that in Britain because it's really really important and why why is the sunshine so important why do we want our summer because we have British winters which are just gray and wet all the time okay and so we know what it is to be in a winter that's quite dark and dismal and so we look forward to our summers and so we want sunshine don't we and warmth because um, we know that by middle of October, it's not going to be that anymore. It's going to be dark, and the evening's coming in, and it's going to be wet. Um, but what God is talking about here is he's using this idea of sunshine to say, actually, folks, the light of my presence is going to be with you. The light of my presence. And so this passage here is, in verse chapter 60, about the restoration of Israel. So as people have been relocated to various parts of the, um, of the empire, the Babylonian empire, Jerusalem, the main city, known in spiritual language as Zion, can you see that at the beginning of this passage in my NIV Bible, um, chapter 60 begins the glory of Zion. You know, Jerusalem, the main city, is in ruins. The walls are rubble. The gates have been burned. The temple destroyed. Even more devastating than that, the presence of God is no longer over the temple of Jerusalem. Okay? The, t the presence of God, the glory of God which had resided. If you remember your Old Testament stories, you write, remember that when Solomon dedicated the temple to God, um, do you remember that? The Shekinah glory came in such power that they all fell on their knees before God. You know, that was the presence of God. It was to be the temple there in <coughs> Jerusalem, the focal point of worship. It was to be the place where people pilgrimage to. Hannah and I went to Canterbury. Well, in, 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 in these times, Israel, everybody walked to Jerusalem at least three times a year, usually with the whole village. That's what Jesus did when he was 12 years old and got lost, okay, was because the whole village had walked to, to Jerusalem. So at this time, Jerusalem was where they walked to. It was the focal point of worship. It was the ordained sacred space where sacrifices were offered, where people could receive forgiveness, where they could encounter him. And it was in ruins. It was demolished. All was gone. And instead, the very few survivors who were there in Jerusalem were remembering the echoes of the past. It was an empty, a ruined place. There was a spiritual darkness all over Jerusalem that stole the joy and the hope. You know, I, I reckon, I don't know, I don't know about you. How do, how, do you, how do you cope with when things don't go well? Okay, how do you cope with that? I mean, do you kind of spiral down into, you know, a, a pit of despair? Do you? No. Do you do that? Do you kind of, and, and some people do. I mean, others, you know, others just kind of seem to say, oh, shrug and kind of muddle through, really. You know, what do you do? I reckon, you know, there'd be some here of those survivors who were feeling such a sense of despair and shame, you know, about their condition and the shame of that. I, I suspect there were others who were saying, oh, well, those days are past, long gone. You know, I just have to get on with life and the dreariness of what it is. But as they looked, as they looked around them, 
at Jerusalem in ruins. I wonder if they remembered, remembered and thought of, yeah, but, but we've heard the stories. We've heard the story of God doing miracles. We've heard the stories of God's glory in this place in such power that people couldn't stand. We've heard the stories how God was with his people, that the enemy was defeated in ways that, that, that didn't require human interaction. I mean, I mean, Joshua just marched around the, around the walls, blew the trumpets, and they fell down. You know? We remember the times when we heard the stories of God being honoured and glorified in this place. And instead, this was a time of darkness. A darkness. And it is into that feeling, into that situation, into that circumstance that this prophecy was given. This prophecy that was saying, hey, there is the time coming. And when it came, it is now that you are to rise and shine because your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. This was the prophecy to say, like the dawn breaking through the darkness of night, God was calling his people to rise up and again live in that light. To live knowing the hope of every day, to live knowing the God of hope and promise. And he says here, look, the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth. Thick blackness is over all the peoples. But for you, for you, the Lord rises and his glory appears over you and nations will come to your light. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful that God is saying, hey, I want to shine over you and in you and through you and your life, and it's my light, but other people are going to see it because I want you to shine. I want you to shine. And Jesus said, in the time of darkness, in the time when it seems there is no hope, there is hope. Because my glory is with you. My light is upon you. I am shining on you and in you and through you. Because I want you to be like Jerusalem. I want you to be like that city on a hill that shines. And shine so much that others see your light and say, oh, I want a bit of that. I want that light. I want to encounter God. That is what Jesus did. We mentioned, didn't we, that um, the f second fulfillment of this was in John. John 1, spoken about there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 1 John 1, 9. Sorry, John 1, 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Jesus was that light. Jesus was that light. And he drew, did he not, all men to him. To see the Father. At a time when the world was dark, when most of the known world at the time was under the oppression of the Roman Empire and there was little hope left, Jesus appeared. And no, he didn't overthrow the might of Rome. He did something much, much greater than that. He overthrew the power of sin and death. And he showed that the glory of God's presence and kingdom is for everyone who believes and follows him. This prophecy in Isaiah 60 was about Jerusalem being restored. It was also about Jesus who was coming and the kingdom, the Zion, the, the city that Jesus was going to establish. And it was also 
also a prophecy that Jesus picked up on in Matthew 5, where he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And this, this chapter here in, in Isaiah 60, it says, look, lift up your eyes and look around you because people are going to come. They're going to come from afar, sons and daughters. You're going to have ships coming in and camels. Yeah, that'd be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? Camels, you know, um, coming up to, to Rosalja. Our equivalent, our equivalent of camels and ships. You know, this is what, this is what you're going to do. You're going to have the flocks. You're going to be restored. There is going to be light. Folks, people are going to be looking to you and asking you, what is this light in your life? What is this light in your life? I want to, I want to, I can see it. I want some of that too. And that is why we are called to rise and shine. We're called to rise and shine, to be the light of the world, because we know what it is to be in darkness. And we live in a dark world. Ephesians 5 verse 8 to 10 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness and truth and find out what pleases the Lord. It's Ephesians 5 verse 8 to 10. We were once in darkness, now we're in light. We once were darkness, now we are light if we've got the life of Jesus shining through us. And the world needs it and God has so ordained it that we are the ones who make a difference. We are the ones that he said would be like the city on the hill. We're meant to shine our light all around us, except it's not our lights we shine, it's, it's, it's God's, okay? So um, just at the moment, last night as I came back, I could see the moon. It's a very, very thin sliver. It's going to be full again before the end of the month because this is a blue moon month where there was a full moon at the beginning of August and there's going to be a full moon at the end of August and that's known as a blue moon when there's two full moons in one um, uh, kind of calendar month, okay? But I saw just a slither of the moon. Now, the moon has no light of its own, none at all. The only reason I could see it was because it was reflecting the sun. I couldn't see the sun. The sun had already gone to bed here in England, so I couldn't see the sun, but I could see the moon because of the reflection of the sun on the moon that was then shining back down to us. That's what we're like, or should be like. God's light, who he is, shining, reflecting in us, because we're full of the Spirit of God, because we are people of God. And we are that reflected light. And you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't take much to banish the darkness. It really, really doesn't. I have here, um, I have it, I carry it around. Just, just it here. Tiny little torch. It's a present from my dad. Okay? Tiny weeny little torch that I carry around. And you might think, oh, that's not going to shine much, Bethany. And um, it, it's just a little one. But you would be surprised at how much I can do with this very little light. With this very little light at all times. It's not much. But the truth is that darkness is only darkness when there is no glimmer of light. And it doesn't take much. And you know what, folks? You know, it doesn't, it really doesn't take much for us to make a difference because you might think, yeah, yeah, I'm not a big torch. I'm just a little tiny weeny little torch thing. But it doesn't take much for us to be a light in the darkness. You know, the voice of care and concern when someone's hurting. A meal, a cake or flowers can, can change somebody's day, can't it? A prayer, just to let them know 
I'm thinking of you. A voice of support to a colleague against, I don't know, racism or injustice. Standing shoulder to shoulder some, uh, with someone against a bully. You know, what, is, what, is your, what are your situations, your daily situations in, in, where you are with the people that you interact, in your street, in your neighbourhood, in your school? You know, where in, in your workplace or with your family can you be just that spark of light? The person who speaks hope and joy rather than complains and moans. The ray of sunshine today, wherever you are. You know, can you wake up in the morning and say, hey, I'm going to rise and shine. I'm going to be somebody's sunbeam. Sunbeam. Sunbeam today. Can you, can you say that? What, what, what difference would that make if you were somebody's sunbeam? If you were to rise and shine. You know, a couple of weeks, our summer's going to be over, isn't it? And this very strange season of school holidays, which is both looked forward to and lovely, and is absolute chaos. And by this time, all the parents are saying, oh, I can't wait for them to go back to school. Um, you know, we'll come to the end. The nights will draw in. You know, the weather is going to turn cool. Um, it will be for those of you who maybe at the moment have been able to switch your alarm clock off. I don't know, that, those alarm clocks, they will go back on, won't they? Okay, those who are working, and maybe you've still been working through all summer, but you can't talk to the right people because they're off on their summer holidays, you know, and you can't get the emails from folk because they're away and nothing's working right and it will all go back for normal. Here in our building, you know, the weekly community groups will, will resume. Okay, what will it mean in the autumn? What will it mean for the winter, for us to rise and shine? What does it mean for us at Rosedale being a Christ-centred community? You know, we want to shine for Jesus, don't we? We want to show his love. And, and the wonderful promise is, look at this, the wonderful promise is that as we shine God's love, that changes the lives of the people that we encounter. And they will see it, and they will come, and it will make a difference, a big difference. And so, where, where, are, you, where are you at? It may be that you're actually thinking, oh, oh my, 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 my situation's a bit dark at the moment, and I need the light of Jesus. Or maybe you're just thinking, yeah, actually, you know what? I know the light of God in my life. I can recognise his blessings. I want to share that with others. Or perhaps you do actually have somebody in mind and at the moment they're in a dark place and need to know the light. The light of Jesus. The light of Jesus. Shall we say a prayer? And wherever this is, wherever you're at at this moment, in the light of Jesus, let's just bring that to the Lord. Let's just bring that to the Lord. What would it mean to rise and shine for you today, tomorrow, Monday morning, for this week, for the autumn season that will soon be coming? What does it mean? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you are the God of light. Wherever there is darkness, you wish to banish that and bring in your life, your love, your hope. We sang before of the wondrous story, and it's that story of forgiveness, that story of mercy and grace, the story of a future. Father, we've looked at this passage and seen how in the darkness of, of, of exile and slavery, you promised 
that they would come home but once again, your presence would shine in Jerusalem. And we thank you, God. We thank you for the restoration of that city and that you did. Lord, we thank you for this prophecy and that it prophesied the coming of the light into the world, which was your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that we look to him. And in the spiritual realm, he is the bright light that shines into our darkness. Lord, there's folk here today who need to see your light, who need you to shine into the dark places in their life, to give them hope, to give them clarity, to give them strength and rest and joy and peace. And Father, we thank you because this prophecy so beautifully ties in with your instruction to us to be the light of the world, for us to be like that city on the hill and not hidden, but out bold, shining for you, shining for you. And at times that light might be, oh, I don't know, as big as a lighthouse. At times it might be just as tiny as this little torch. or like a flicker of candlelight. But God, I want to thank you that wherever there is light, the darkness has to flee. And so, Father, I pray, I pray for us. God, I pray for us that we will be your light in this world. That this week, we will be your sunbeam. We will be that ray of light. That we will rise and shine for you. Shine your light around into the world the people, the relationships that we're in, that we bring hope and joy and smiles to those that you've led us to be with. Lord, we want to be your light, we pray. Amen.